Welcome to this Windstream webinar on the heightened trend of bank and credit union M&A activity and how senior technology leaders can assist in defending against acquisition or for those in acquisition mode, how they can be ensure technology contributes to earnings, accretion, and integration efficiency. My name is Bucky Porter and I am a financial services industry analyst with Windstream Enterprise and I will be your host. Um, prior to joining Windstream Enterprise, I spent 25 years in the banking industry in roles ranging from sales director for a $15 billion regional bank to chief lending officer for a $200 million community bank. Well, as of early December of uh, this year, over 250 acquisitions have been announced, uh, including both banks and credit unions. And the pace is predicted by many to be as steady, if not increase, as we go into 2022. Uh, and with this in mind, I'm excited and honored to have John Vincent, Managing Director with Cornerstone Advisors, join me to discuss strategies that senior technology leaders can employ, uh, whether they're fighting to remain independent or their bank is in acquisition mode. Um, John, why don't you share with our audience a bit of your background and the work that you're currently doing at Cornerstone? Yeah, thanks, Bucky, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, you know, my background's really serendipitous because uh, I'm an engineer who's kind of moved through sales and development and leadership and entrepreneurialism. And um, I think the single common thread is I've been in financial services and technology uh, for the majority of my career, starting with IBM, kind of in the infrastructure days, working with a community banking reseller in Charlotte named Broadway and Seymour. I joined IBM in the research and development division. I'm an automation engineer from Carnegie Mellon, and I ended up crossing over into sales, and they were my first client. So after doing kind of data center AS400 work with them and some other financial institutions in the 90s, I, I, I saw this opportunity to use fat clients and branch automation, and that was a big deal. And there were a few community banks, regional banks in the Carolinas that were beginning what became a very big growth pattern. <laughs> and I started working very closely with NCNB, Nations Bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Wachovia, when they were small banks heading into mergers and acquisitions. Um, late, I left and started my own internet company, sold it, got hired by Bank of America and built commercial uh, cash management systems online, ended up kind of being the CIO of the call center strategy execution for a 13,000 seat call center in 28 cities, and then head of enterprise payment strategies. Uh, a little later in my career, I got uh, recruited to go to Jack, uh, Jack Henry, part of Broadway and Seymour, was acquired by them, and I ran their internet online banking, and then eventually about 20% of the P&L. Uh, in the fourth quarter of my career, as I call it, uh, hopefully I see the end. <laughs> and the clock's ticking away. I, I joined Cornerstone because when I was at Jack Henry, they were a consultant who worked with us. And I just, uh, normally those can be very adversarial relationships, but they were just always professional and formed, very bright. Uh, you know, you might see Gonzo Banker over my shoulder. They're, they're a direct speaking kind of tell the truth consulting firm uh, out of Phoenix, Arizona, uh, about 130 consultants strong, exclusively community banks, regional banks, and credit unions. We, we don't deal with, deal with the tier ones at all. Um, and in that organization, I'm part of the technology practice, which is about a quarter of what we do. We also do contracts and strategy and execution, and we have a very strong research uh, group that works with fintechs and institutions. Um, and so I run the technology advisory practice. I'm kind of the generalist looking at all aspects of technology, people process technology, and how it supports the, the financial institutions. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and your, your background is perfect for what we're going to talk about today. You know, as you and I were kind of working on what topic we wanted to discuss, we kept coming back to the fact that there's so many mergers and acquisitions that have been taking place this year and, and anticipated to continue next year. And um, you know, One of the things as a, as a consultant within my own company, I'm trying to inform our 
sellers on how to talk to banks, how to talk to credit unions, and and give them kind of the trends that that I see happening. Um, as as I've really thought this process through around M and A activity, I think there's two two different audiences uh, that that need advice uh, from folks like yourself. Um, one is those banks that are fighting to remain independent, whether they're a small community bank or heck, even a decent sized regional bank or credit union, uh, they're not acquisition, um, they're, they're, they're open to acquisition if they're not careful. There's some things they can be doing to try to defend against that. So I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about that first and then we'll kind of flip the coin and look at uh, banks that are in acquisition. They are looking to grow, I guess, inorganically, if you will, um, and there are issues that they're dealing with. And, and we're specifically going to be talking about those senior technology leaders and what they can bring to the table, uh, whether they're defending or whether they're in acquisition. So, so why don't we kind of start with that defending against acquisition and uh, kind of with the with the clients you're working with and your thoughts around it. What are what are some keys that these senior technology leaders should be focused on in helping position their bank to be um, immune to acquisition of policy? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And, you know, there's a lot of banks that want to stay fiercely independent. I love there was a book written years ago uh, by, the, by uh, the, the, the CEO of BB&T talking about how he navigated being acquired by all the people around him that were, <laughs> were acquiring banks. So it's a great read if you want to go through it. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I, the, the couple points I would take away from this is the first thing is you got to differentiate um, how you're, you go to market. So from a technology standpoint, you have to decide, you know, where does your bank or credit union, you know, because credit unions, by the way, is part of a trend, <laughs> Are, are, are doing more mergers and they're right. also buying banks and it's right. kind of an interesting phenomenon and we're even seeing in this space fintechs buying into banks for, for strategic reasons um, and, and so part of the technology role is to align to the business strategy and then help differentiate and so um, if, if you're, you're a commercial bank for instance in a rural area you know, you might want to invest more heavily in what creates value for your frontline lenders, for your lending committee, review board, whatever it is. If you kind of have a tiered approval process, you may want to invest heavily, not only in workflow automation that helps that, but also decisioning tools such as database and business intelligence or data analytics that will help create insight and value to grow your commercial loan portfolio cost okay. effectively. Sure. And when you do that, you may, you may underemphasize investing in other things. Not that you're going to let your retail frontline associates suffer, but you might not have to buy as much leading edge cloud based new technology. You might be okay with kind of proven effective components of technology and other aspects. So that's how is the, CIO, you're not running just the tech stack, you're really focused much more on driving value. And that, that can go all the way down to technology. Um, you can augment a outsource components that are not helping you differentiate. Many parts of our technology stack are becoming commodities. And in commodity markets, you're better to let the volume producers run those. They run them more efficiently, they run them more reliably, they tend to run them just better than a small community bank with a, or a community institution can, uh, typically with a small staff. Okay. So, you know, I, I'd say augment what you want with your technology and sometimes good, you gotta let good be good enough. Sure. Well, good, and, and with that differentiation, does that then bring along um, any type of specialization uh, or focus that they need to, to have? Yeah, I mean, focus is certainly, I, I think, the key And as you go through this. Um, I, I think of a client that uh, was in the shadows of a major metropolitan geography. They 
they had an incredible operating efficiency ratio. Uh, the leadership team just said, you know, you got always keep in mind the cost of human capital. You got to invest in technology that helps, you know, minimize um, the cost of human capital and facilitate the, the people that are here to do better. What you invest in needs to be relevant to your client and it has to create operating leverage. And those three questions as a litmus test, I thought were the sharpest way to focus in on do you or do you not do a technology? You know, does it, does it affect your human capital? Is it relevant to your client? And does it create operating leverage? What a way to hone in on all the, you know, technology is complex and there's thousands of features, fun functions, benefits, reasons, acronyms, things that the line of business people don't get. But as a technology leader, if you can demonstrate that it's positively impacting you, you, your, your workforce and it's good for your client and it creates operating leverage, you'll get executives to buy in and help and you're helping the, the institution be stronger because that operating leverage is, is the kind of the key to competing going forward. Gotcha. Well, you mentioned leverage and, and you know, are there any, uh, any kind of words of advice that you would give around how to help you know, reduce uh, expenses or even have revenue production as a part of what the technology leader can bring to the table? Yeah, you know, depending on the size of the institutions, we, we do, we still scale pretty broadly. Our largest clients, you know, we still do work for a client that has, you know, a hundred billion dollars plus in deposits but we're, we're typically in a much more community and regional focused institutions and you know there's just not a lot of staff so what I, what I always do when I go in is I really kind of work on assessing what is creating value add to the business and, and what could be just turned over somewhere else and, you know, years ago, when I got in this business in the 1980s, implementing a central computing uh, data center was a really a big automation process. It, in many banks, it was still replacing paper ledgers right. <laughs> in some places. I mean, they were still, there was still a master ledger. Um, and then the ability to, you know, augment and advance, make advances in, um, your channels has just continued to put it, push it forward. So the leverage comes in, can you get, can you kind of start getting rid of your infrastructure as a service? Can you outsource that to somebody who can do infrastructure better than you? Can you outsource more than the infrastructure? Can you outsource the platform, maybe up through the operating system? And then if you add value running the application, run it. Or, or can you outsource and just get rid of, the software as a service and focus on integration and let the, the value add be the integration. And it's the same thing with network services. I mean, are you really getting value from that? And I'll have people argue, you know, I can defend it better and I can pay attention uh, to network infra information security risks better. And, and, you know, the short answer is, cause I'm not saying this to any one person, the short answer is you can't. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the larger institutions have the opportunity, if you pick the right partners, to be much better at it than any small institution will be. Um, and, and even when you create leverage, you're not abdicating responsibility. You still have to be accountable with an information security officer person, chief information security officer, to make sure that that whole environment where it's outsourced and leveraged is effective, efficient, and safe. But the leverage comes in from pivoting from low dollar, you know, infrastructure management skills to high dollar value of integration architecture kind of engineering. And I've seen those pivots happen numerous times as people go through uh, uh, growing. And the reason that people that want to stay independent end up failing and collapsing is the skills and the technology team can't keep pace to bring new technology in. So it's almost imperative that the skill set get rid of the things that are non-value add and that daily operating stack, give those up 
not give them to someone else, but outsource those or partner with someone else to do the non-value add. And this, the leadership teams transform into, into creating that ability to focus and differentiate when you have a limited resource pool. Right, right. And I know one thing that we had talked about um, is oftentimes when banks are looking at how do I survive or how do I remain independent, they may look to new technologies. But oftentimes, as, as you indicated, they've already got a lot of really great technology at their fingertips that they may just not be using. So kind of share with us maybe a, a, a little bit about what you've learned over the years in terms of how often people are using all of the game yeah. programs they currently have. Yeah, thank you. I mean, and we did talk about that previously. And, you know, when we go into institutions, very often um, they're taking advantage about, of about 20 percent of the capability of what their core wow. systems and attached systems have provided. And it's so funny because, you know, that's a reaction. I get that from the line of business when I go in. They'll, they'll have that, wow, oh, my. And yeah. um, But the technology team goes, yeah. You know, we've been asked to, by the business leaders to bring so many things and to integrate it because they're hearing about great new single feature functions or applications that are a little better than what they have that they got and get acquired and the tech teams may have to integrate them. And so if you're a, if you're the technology leader, who's down looking down and managing the data center, as opposed to looking into the line of business or out to the marketplace, yeah, you're going to get stuck and trapped integrating other people's vision, but you need to be at the table so that you can, when the need comes up, you can do the research and utilize what you already have and show them, Hey, you know, that new application is really expensive and I can do 80% of that with what we have today and that would be what we need. And then you have a business discussion to say, is this where we want to spend our marginal dollar to grow? So, you know, before you buy, just go use what you have and then take, take advantage of vendor training and education and bring them in or bring someone like us in you know, and let us help you take a look at what you have and see how can we simplify your, your, your technology, get more out of what you have and, and lower that, that cost basis. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, the last thing that kind of follows out of that then is if you're creating leverage and you're utilizing what you have to help defend against this, you really want to collaborate a lot more we're doing it today. I mean, we're not in the same city. We're working. I see you. I can tell when you're, when you're smiling and I say something that's good or when you're browse for, and I, I do some wrong, but you know, collaboration platforms and the unified collaborate, uh, unified collaboration makes a big deal. And we tend to do it a lot in internal meetings, but you know, extend it through your contact center. You know, people are getting comfortable and, you know, now's a chance to pivot and help differentiate that when, you know, can you link your digital mobile online banking and have a window that hot, hot keys into your call center? That technology's there. And, you know, can they get someone in your institution that differentiates it? Because I'll tell you what, you know, you call Bank of America call center and we did great things when I was there and we, we, we made many advancements with text and automated scripting and knowledge where the one thing we could never do were answer the phones fast with a friendly face with someone they knew. So if you can extend your enterprise and put a, fa a warm, friendly face up in the, com the community institution that right. you're a part of, you know, that's a way to leapfrog the technology collaborating in extending your enterprise. So you can also use it for remote work, workforce. Technology people are hard to get and expensive today. Yeah. So it, don't force them to come in if you want to be competitive. You know, open up your mindset and figure out how to work and hire the, great, the best people. I had a client in LA who, who was talking about moving their data center to Phoenix because it would be so much cheaper to operate. And I was like, you own the building, you have the space, you, you don't have much going on on your racks and servers, which we did talk about moving those, but until you do, let, it, let your network engineers be remote. Don't, don't try and hire in an LA market and pay an LA salary. 
you know, and by the way, it doesn't have to be Phoenix. You can get them, you can get really good talent in much cheaper markets uh, if you can let them work remotely. Right. And without going down too much of a rabbit trail, another kind of industry theme that I've uh, really been promoting internally at Windstream is the idea that uh, we've got to be able to help banks and credit unions ex extend the walls of their branches so that um, you know, with the customer traffic down post pandemic and probably never picking back up to where it was pre pandemic, uh, we've got to find a way as an industry to uh, go to our customer and meet them on their terms. And, and customers are demanding that. And it doesn't take the biggest asset bank to achieve that. Even the smaller organizations can find ways to uh, virtually interact with customers, whether that's through call center or branches. And so I think it touches on that as well. So great. Well, um, all right. So we spent you know a good bit of time talking about how uh, again a senior technology leader can help their bank or credit union defend against acquisition and remain independent. But you know we do know that there's a lot of acquisition going on, and so there are those that are hot and hungry. I've worked for a few of those, um, and and they're ready to go out and just grow as quickly as they can, and they feel like they've got some good opportunities right now. Uh, but with that comes a lot of work, and that's a lot of what the work that you do is helping banks with, again, becoming as accretive to earnings as quickly as possible, and also dealing with all of the integration that goes along with uh, acquisition after it's happened, after it's been announced. So what are some things that, that a senior technology leader could do, maybe even proactively, uh, before, say, an acquisition is announced? To help add value at that executive level and in, in rationalizing who they choose as a target based on the technology pieces and what are the considerations that they need to take to that executive team to um, make the right decision on who to acquire and then as quickly as possible do that integration. Yeah. So um, pre-acquisition, we do a lot of, there's a lot of things that go on. Um, from a technology standpoint, and, and these answers may seem rudimentary depending on the sophistication of the acquisition machine that sure. exists for the institution. So I'm going to start kind of rudimentary and build to, you know, kind of the complete. First thing is that it's always easier if you can merge or buy an institution that's on similar platforms. Core conversions are easier when one of you, one of them is, you know, already built and ready to take on that new because you'll have a joint workforce that know how to do the mergers. It allows you to, as people are retiring, kind of merge and, and get a new group of leaders that can come in, help and run. Um, and that extends throughout the element of, of all this. So um, you have to kind of keep, keep in mind those those platform technology or co technology costs. Um, I, I think the second thing is assess your people costs because um, technology and people will be uh, the number one and number two expenses in almost every institution you talk with. So um, ninety percent of the time, technology costs are number one. Um, people costs are second. The whole idea of a merger is taking, you know, a dollar worth of revenue in this bank, a dollar worth of revenue in this bank, each that have 65 cents of cost, putting them together, getting two dollars worth of revenue, and instead of having a dollar thirty, cut that down to a dollar twenty, and take your efficiency ratios better. Yeah. And you have to do that by reducing cost and kind of reducing people through leverage the people it's kind of nice because attrition usually lets that work out um, in most in most cases many cases um, so if if i were starting to do this i would sit down and do a swot analysis of my strengths my weaknesses opportunities and threats around people and technology it will size scale will be a good target to land people on and who's in our ecosphere that has similar platforms and technologies that we could bring in. Um, and then, you know, start early and try and be engaged in the discussions with your executive team that are making those decisions. Uh, depending on where you sit as a technology leader, um, many times the technology team has 
a seat at the table if you're a CIO and operating at a high level aligned with the business. You know, you may be involved in knowing who's being looked at, what discussions are being had, and even the, the, the potential candidate pool of, of targets to merge with. Okay. Um, and so if you can get to there as a technology leader, that's where you add the most value. If not, inform and have these dialogues with the people that would be making those decisions so they know who would be the best candidates from, from where, you're, where you're working. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, those are the common elements. Surprisingly for engineers like me, the merger and acquisition process is, um, it, it's done a lot of ways, but when it's done correctly, it's not, a, there's not a lot of people involved in that decision. It's usually done by looking at a few competitive uh, alignment things. Would it augment the existing strategies? Would it be financially accretive is a term that's very often used. And then uh, ultimately, it, will the cultures match? Um, technology is that fourth stack under those three. And I've seen times where the technology is considered and I've seen them when they're not. And when they're not considered, it's, uh, it's bumpy yeah. and higher odds of failure. So um, that's kind of my 35 years of watching I would like to say thousands of mergers. Wow. Um, I'm very comfortable saying, you know, high hundreds of mergers. Yeah. Well, that's why you're the guest speaker today. <laughs> it's been that you've got the experience. <laughs> well, so, so, okay, so we talked about kind of if, a, if a, a technology leader could be proactive, that's an ideal world. But oftentimes um, they find out about the same time many others in the company find out, hey, we, we're acquiring so-and-so. Um, and now the work really begins uh, with integration, kind of looking at uh, what softwares and hardwares and everything that the that the, that the acquisition target brings to the table. So, um, you know, talk about kind of the things that you're recommending to technology leaders in determining and recommending. Uh, I've, I've got it down as kind of ours, theirs, or a new solution. If, if that's the right. Approach. Yeah. Yeah, we, we get involved very often in those decisions. Um, sometimes you go in and it's very obvious because, you know, you, A, you might be on the same platform, so it's a simple consolidation. B, let's use cores, but this could, this could just as easily be your digital solutions or any other component of this technology stack, any of the channels or, or features. But let's just start with cores if they're the same cores it's pretty easy what where you're going to go from there and then you you, you agree to the core and you, then you start picking kind of best of breed integrated point solutions um, the second scenario that's pretty easy is that you have um, two cores uh, one's very strategic well placed in the market and suited for the direction you're going and the other one's an older legacy outdated core um, that probably needs to go away. Um, and, and that one's pretty easy too because you can make a selection pretty quickly. The third one that's hard is when you have two different institutions with two different core systems that are both viable contenders, so like on a go forward strategy. Um, and so you can kind of see as you look at those, that's thinking about how you frame it, those are the, the high level thoughts. As a technology leader, what I always advise people is you know, don't get hung up in defending your core um, we've come into and done very rapid assessments because it turns out that it goes back to this whole alignment focus and differentiation you know you got to kind of do this business needs assessment to figure out where's the combined institution going and then pick the best one yeah so I've seen I've seen leaders get defensive entrench leak information to vendors and and candidly, at the end of those days, they, that's pretty transparent because if you do this for a living, you can find out pretty quickly when there's a leak in the ship in the way that the vendors behave. Um, you know, you're better to kind of pretty quickly, adopt, you know, just wear the hat of the new institution and put that institution first, play on the same team. 
And there usually is a seat for talent in all organizations. You know, candidly, a lot of this is driven by a little bit of fear. And so, you know, you go through that. Um, You know, the the big things as you go through these, these conversion planning sessions are, you know, picking the right target operating model. Uh, and that's more than technology. So as I kind of talked about thinking about how the businesses come together, usually there's a pre-merger team that's working on that target operating model, negotiating through. And, the, and the, you know, one of the biggest unknowns that should be done pre, pre-acquisition is an assessment of all your contracts, the terms that are existing on contracts, the termination fees, deconversion fees, switching costs. Um, you know, I've seen contracts where there's soft dollars that are were given, used, but it, in the fine print of the contract, candidly, uh, it says if you do a merger, you owe those dollars back. And they can be kind of poison pills that um, have really negatively affected some pretty significant acquisitions and mergers. And, you know, depending on where you're Financials are being reported. It can be reported as you've missed, you know, the stated goals of the integration. So uh, there's a lot of things to look there at there and you just um, working through them is um, easy if you've done it. I mean, candidly, this gets to how sophisticated is your acquisition machine, which is probably the last point I would make in this topic. Um, is if you're going to be an acquiring machine, you start to build skill sets. And I always thought, uh, in my own backyard, I always saw Bank of America do this well. First Union did it well. Wachovia did it well as they were building their their groups. <clears throat> they had core leaders that would knew how to run and lead mergers. They did augment it with outside resources. But then between mergers, those people went back into line of business roles which sometimes can be hard because those the, the good seats have executives in them or re- managers or resources in them. Um, very often they went back into functional roles that, that would do, you know, quality and productivity kind of operational efficiency roles to learn and help the merger can kind of post closing and post going live day one be smoother and better and take continue to take costs down that way when the next merger came in they would be pulled back into the merger team and they were really more knowledgeable about process mapping flows the nuance and details that help them be effective in the next merger when they got bigger so you know as you go through that the last thing successful teams do is they kind of build this yin and yang of a successful staff to help help go through mergers so, John, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I really appreciate you, you sharing um, both kind of your overall knowledge as well as some kind of individual instances in which you've assisted uh, organizations, financial institutions. Um, but let's kind of put a button on it and, and kind of wrap this up with some key takeaways. So we have talked about two sides of, a, of, of, of the same coin, um, and what are those takeaways that you would give to someone who is looking to defend against? Yeah, I mean, I think just in simple summary, remember to make sure you help. Technology helps you differentiate in your market, focus and and align on kind of that human capital relevance to clients and creating operating leverage. Within leverage, utilize your existing applications and collaborate. Um, I think on the other side of the coin is if you're um, part of the acquisition machine, you know, Assess your capabilities early to take on a new institution through a SWOT analysis, thinking about the people and technology costs. Be proactive with, uh, with your team um, to, to kind of understand where you're at in that engagement. Post the announcement, partner with a new team. Don't fight and defend your stack. You know, really just kind of pick the best opportunities and, and move on. And then, you know, ultimately, from a contract standpoint, there's lots of opportunities in your contracts, both good and bad. So watch for the poison pills that they don't blow up. But make sure you get the negotiated new leverage that creates the savings you're looking for. It doesn't all have to come from you. Your vendors um, and partners can all chip in and, and make it a win-win. Fantastic. 
Well, John, I really appreciate you joining me today, and I appreciate our audience for tuning in and uh, watching what I feel like is a relevant topic for, for the financial industry today. Um, if uh, anyone wants to reach out to you at Cornerstone Advisors, what's the best way for them to do that, John? Um, you know, really, uh, go just go onto our website, um, at, and, and you can the team photos are there and our contacts there. Um, my email is complicated because we're cornerstone without a couple of vowels. <laughs> um, so through through the website, and I would also just encourage you if you if you want some thought leadership around this, you can also sign up for the our blog Gonzo Banker uh, under the resource section and get just free content. Uh, sometimes it's funny, uh, it's always poignant uh, and thought provoking. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a great read, and I always enjoy getting a new a new blog or uh, uh, post. Uh, Sent it sent to my inbox. So I appreciate that. Well, again, I'm Bucky Porter, uh, and, and this has been Windstream Enterprise. Um, so that you know, we've been supporting over 2,500 banks and credit unions with over 13,000 locations, uh, and, and look forward to assisting your bank if you have any questions about cloud enabled connectivity, unified communications, or security. Those are the the ways that we can assist you, uh, whether you're in acquisition mode or defending against acquisition. And uh, you can reach out to us through windstreamenterprise.com. And there we have, we'll have this video posted along with it being on YouTube and a lot of other thought leadership, both within the financial services industry and others. So thank you again, John, and we uh, will make it a wrap.